Hey, this is Derek St. Holmes, and you're listening to the Ocean Way Nashville. It's going to be great podcast. Storms in Nashville today, high of six. Today on the first episode of the Ocean Way Nashville, it's going to be great podcast. We are honored to have rock legend, Mr. Derek St. Holmes. Hey, 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 everybody. So, Derek, yes. uh, you're originally hailing from the Detroit, Michigan area. Yeah. You grew up with such influences as the Stones, the Beatles, Marvin Gaye, a lot of Motown stuff, yes. Souls, Blues, Luther Franklin, R&B. Smokey Robinson. Growing up, you know, as a kid, you had to know all that stuff coming out of Detroit. Gotcha. Plus... Rock and roll. Plus rock and roll. roll. And as far as your history as an artist, your most known, your most notable song is Stranglehold. Yes. By Ted Nugent. You also wrote songs like Hey Baby. Yes. Just What the Doctor Ordered. Yeah. Snakeskin Cowboys. Yep. Death by Misadventure. Yep. Live It Up, Dog Eat Dog, and many others. Yes. Yep. Um, You were also a member of a band that I believe only did one record, St. Paradise. That's correct. And uh, you're also a member of Whitford St. Holmes. Correct. And you have two releases as Whitford St. Holmes. Right. And we like to put 40 years in between those <laughs> albums. <laughs> so there's another one coming up in a few years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, uh, in 2000, you released your first solo project. Right. And do you have uh, plans or intentions of doing more solo work? Um, yeah, I, I kind of would like to go in the studio here soon. And I have two things I'd like to get done in the next year and a half. One would be a blues album, because I'm a big blues nut. Nice. And um, one would be another Derek St. Holmes solo record that um, I've already written most of the material for. And... Just want to get in there and get that done. It's just between life and trying to get in the studio, it's it's a lot. Absolutely. So the Derek St. Home solo record, would that be more just like your tradition your your classic stuff, like hard rock stuff? Or? I, I think so, yeah. It would be a little bit more of the melodic hard rock, I call it. Yeah, or sort of a little bit more hate to use the word pop, but but a little bit more mainstream, harder rock and roll. Sure. Yeah. And when you say you want to do a blues record, what type of blues record do you see yourself doing? Is it I, like a blues I, rock? Or? I think, no, because I, I, I'm so rhythm and blues based anyway yep. that most of the time when I do a rock album, it has a lot of rhythm and blues in it anyway. So this one, I think I'm going to do the same thing that everybody else does. <laughs> I'm going to go back and, and pick my favorite classic traditional blues songs and do them as true to form as possible. I will probably use older instruments and play badly and play out of tune. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, you know, those guys back then, they would put one mic in the room and you'd go for it. And I kind of want to do that kind of thing. I want to get that organic, bluesy kind of thing and Use an upright bass and, you know, acoustic guitar and, and, and maybe a electric guitar. But again, I'll try to get, try to borrow some really vintage era guitars and stuff like that. That's what I'm thinking now, but we'll see. To make it more about the feel and the yeah. vibe, not necessarily everything has to be right. perfection. Yeah, no, it's more about the feel and the vibe. And it's, it's more about retracing the steps and going back. And anybody that listens to it, especially, you know, a younger generation who nowadays are going to school to learn how to do this stuff and learn how to record and how mics work and how it, songs work and how you write them. And I kind of want to go back and revisit that so they can hear how it could be done now, nowadays. I mean, they'll really hear the difference between a recording everything on a Mac <laughs> versus going analog and just having one or two mics in the room. And, you know, it's it's a sonic thing for me. You right. Know? 
And that's plugging Oceanway Studios. That's a lot of what we do here. We have yes. vintage Neve consoles, which are analog consoles, yes. which do have a different sound than yes. you know recording something out of the box on your computer or in the box on your computer. Right. So let's backtrack a little bit. So you recently recorded something here at Oceanway Studios. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what was it for? I guess we, we should say we are in Ocean Way right now, and I'm really excited about that. So, um, And we're in Studio C. Correct. Yes. And I think when I was here, I recorded in Studio B. B, and that was amazing. So there, there's a fundraiser every year by a gentleman's family, Ronnie James Dio, who is one of the great rock singers of our time. One of the best. Yes. And he unfortunately passed away too early from cancer. So his family carries on his wishes of having a foundation every year, and they raise money for cancer. And they reach out to a lot of different singers and a lot of different players, and they ask if they would do a song. Um, usually it's a Dio song or um, sometimes a Black Sabbath or sometimes a Rainbow. Or So this time I was asked uh, on a short notice to come in and sing a song that was recorded by the drummer from Rainbow who used to work with Ronnie. There's a little bit of a history. So he wanted to do a song that he helped make famous, which was a Journey song, because he was in the original version of Journey, which is, um, it was, on this recording, it was Steve Perry. And I don't know how many people out there are familiar with Steve Perry, but he's one of the great, greatest singers in rock and roll. I think a few people have heard of him. I think they have. What, and what was the drummer's name? Ainsley Dunbar. Ainsley Dunbar. And, uh, nice English gentleman that... Um, I remember we took them on their first tour when, when he was in Rainbow, and we had a good time. It was a lot of fun, and you meet a lot of people when you do stuff like that. So, you know, they came back and asked me if I wanted to walk in and sing this song, and I've always had people come up and go, I think you have the same register as Deep Perry. And I go, well, I guess so, because I can sing what, you know, what he sings, and I know he can sing what I sing, so... When we used to tour together, Steve would stand on the side of the stage and he'd see me sing, and I'd stand on the side of the stage and watch him sing. Sort of like a mutual ad admiration society, you know. But So it was fun. I had a chance to come in, and thank goodness I was able to come into Ocean Way. And with the tracks that we had, which were really sort of uh, not sketchy, but I mean it was not planned as well as it should have been, but we used somebody that graduated from... Belmont. Belmont. And uh, her name escapes me. Her Caitlin. name. Caitlin. And she was absolutely fantastic. And she never got shook. She never got rattled. And she made it happen. And we knocked that thing out. And any anything that I, and I've been recording for oh, over 40 years. She's probably been recording for, I don't know, how long you think? Four years? If not even that much. Probably. Right. But she knew all the lingo. She knew exactly what I was talking about. She knew exactly what I needed when I asked for it. So I would say that somebody is teaching these kids right here. Somebody's doing something right. So That's an Music Business 101. It's trial by fire. Let's, yeah, let's absolutely. throw you in and see what you can do. Yeah. So that song is out and available now. Is that correct? I think so, yes. I um I was just over at the Gibson factory before I got here, and one of the ladies upstairs came up to me, and she goes, wow, that song, Wheel in the Sky, that you sang. And I went, how'd you hear that? She goes, oh, it's out there. And I went, oh, wow. She said, man, you did an incredible job. That was awesome. And I said, wow, that's great. And she said, can I get a picture? <laughs> I said, of course you can. Are you kidding me? Awesome. So that was very sweet of her. Very nice. So let's backtrack a little bit. So what sparked your initial interest in music? How did you get started? Oh, uh, my my mother is, I say is, God rest her soul, she's passed. But I mean, she is the singer in the family. She sang in the church all my life. Ever since I was five years old, I could sing. And I would go to church and watch my mom sing in the choir. I'd watch my mother also do a lot of solos. So in watching her prepare to do this stuff for every Sunday, um, it was just always around the house. So I, I loved singing. That was easy. I loved music. My parents both played a lot of records. 
It's a round thing. It's sort of dark and yeah. <laughs> He's explaining what a record called, is to all the kids today. Called a record, <laughs> yeah. So they played these records in our house, and we had a lot of rhythm and blues. My dad liked that kind of stuff, and my mother and my father used to dance on on the weekends, and our cousins and my uncles and aunts would come over, and they'd have like dance parties. They'd dance, and so sort of entertaining or being in front of people kind of came natural. So I think I kind of started to hear that. But I will tell you what really bit me. My dad came home from work one day and he said, he rushed in the house and he said, we have to turn on the Ed Sullivan show tonight. We got to watch it, which we did a lot anyway, in black and white, I might add. And um, he goes, we got to watch this guy tonight. His name is Elvis Presley. And... Coming home from work, I guess you heard on the radio in the car, and they said they're only going to film him from the waist up. And I'm thinking, I'm just probably maybe 10, 11. I'm going, whoa, what's that mean? <laughs> what, what is going on with that deal? And I had no idea about s- sex appeal or any of that kind of stuff. or you know. And so he said, yeah, we got to watch it. So I watched Elvis Presley that night, and I was just smitten, man. He, the way he moved, the way he sang— how soulful he was, the way he looked, and that was it for me. I saw girls screaming and going crazy, and I went, that's a good job right there. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> and that's, that's what got me. That's awesome. I don't know if this is true, but I've heard the story. Um, there was always controversy with Elvis being on that show, like you just said, filming him from the waist up. I discovered or read recently that Colonel Tom Parker told them to do that ah. because he knew it would create controversy. Yeah, I would not be surprised. That that goes along with Alice Cooper and the Chicken. It Absolutely. goes along with Ozzy Osbourne and the Bat. All those things are kind of made up. They're all made up. Um, there was a thing f- about Ted Nugent where he stared a man down that had a firearm at, at our concert. That was all made up. And um, but it creates controversy and it makes you want to go see what it is. And sadly enough, I think that YouTube <laughs> takes the excitement out of a lot of stuff. Takes the controversy out. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about your history as far as your exposure to music coming from your mother and your family. Mm-hmm. What was your path to get into the music business? So you saw Elvis. On Ed Sullivan, you knew that's what you wanted to do. Right. What was the plan of action to go from point A to point B to actually get into the music business? Well, I think, to be honest, um, there were many times when I would be in the basement up in a little town called Riverview, Michigan, which is about 14 miles south of Detroit. And it was the suburbs. And uh, my parents would have these parties. So I started to get good at pantomiming. I would put a tennis racket on. I'd make a mic out of, out of a broomstick, I think, and I would stand there and I would fake it and, and pretend like I was singing the Rolling Stones song or the, or the Elvis song. And I started to do that for the family, and then my mother kept prodding me to do it, and I think it's just, like I say, it got natural. And then all of a sudden I went, well, this is silly. I should... I should just get a guitar. So I did not know how to play a guitar. And I went to the next city over, which was a city called Trenton, Michigan, which was just a couple miles down. And there was a little music store there, a little mom and pop music store. So we go in. My dad takes me in. My dad was always a big proponent of my playing and always helped me. So we we go in and the guy has a package where it's like $24 a month or something. I get this Stella acoustic guitar and a lesson every week. So we, we kind of start that way. And we're playing first first week. The guy would come in. The guy had his, had his deal down because he would come in, say, look at these two notes right here. Here's where they are on the neck. Just start playing those back and forth. And work on that, and I'll be right back. And what he would do is set you off on a two-note get-down, and he'd leave the room. You could see he's outside smoking cigarettes and chatting up everybody out there. And I'm thinking, okay, is, am I it's not supposed to be you know, hands-on taunt what we're doing? So finally, about four days of that, 
probably within about four weeks, I, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I don't think I'm learning anything from this guy. I, he, this is what he's doing. And my dad goes, what? He's doing what? And I go, yeah, he's not even in there. So we quit that. The guitar stayed with the, with the place. So we go away. And my dad seeks out another store in another little town adjacent to Riverview called Southgate. For people that are from these areas, they'll know these towns and they'll get a little history and they'll get a little kudos, but usually I never even mention it. So in Southgate, Michigan, there's a little little guy named Mr. Vincente. He said, I'll show you how to play. He gave me a guitar. He said, take this home. Don't touch it. Just take it home. Don't try to put your hands on it. Don't try to play it until tomorrow. Now, again, not knowing it, but thinking about it now, it almost sounds like Colonel Parker. Because <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I did when I got home, I started playing things on it. I tried to come up with noises. First song I came up with was Twist and Shout on my own. And I fingered it out, you know, down... Dun, 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 dun. And I'm thinking, wow, I don't even know how to play it. I got that accomplished. So the next day when I went in, he asked me, he said, did you touch the guitar? And I said, nope. <laughs> and he goes, okay, well, let's start. And he started showing me chords and this and that. So I got pretty good at that. I think I did that three months. And I started to get really good because two of my buddies in high school play guitar. And we started a competition. So, you know, I, I was moving along pretty quick. So. Mr. Vincente said to my dad, he said, I don't think I can teach him what he wants to know because I don't play the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and that stuff's starting to hit hard, you know. So, so he kind of bowed out. He gave me a younger kid that worked there and the kid was not a good teacher. He was in a band and thought he could teach, but he couldn't. So I just quit. And then I started going around watching people play and copying what they did. And I would hang out at mu music stores and watch people. And I've seen some of my heroes in a music store before, like Bob Seeger and different people, uh, Jimmy McCarty from, from a band called Cactus, and Mitch Ryder in the Detroit Wheels. I would see these guys in there, and I'd watch them play from just across the room, and I'd watch intently and just go, wow, okay, then, all right, this is that, this is this. And you can't hardly walk up to them and go, can you play that one more time? <laughs> Right. So you got really good at it. But that's kind of how I got started doing all that. And then when I could play the guitar, I started to go around and try to put a band together. And your first band was when? In high school? First band was in junior high, the end of junior high, I guess. I think we, or maybe even sooner than that, I think I was 14, putting a band together. We all, we'd wear the same stuff and we'd play Oh, gosh. You know, we'd play Credence stuff. Or we'd play Beatles. We'd play Rolling Stones. Play the Animals. Um, and we'd just kind of start knocking stuff around. And I started at, at an early age trying to write songs. I thought, it's the same old thing, you know. I thought that I don't want to copy somebody for the rest of my life. i got to figure out how they do this. You know, i got to figure out. can't be hard. I mean... So I'd start coming up with a lyric, and I'd start coming up with a couple verses, and then, oh, it's called a bridge. Okay, we'll do a bridge. And then and he hit the chorus, and the chorus is supposed to be big. So I come from that era. So even though I was big on Led Zeppelin and all these, you know, in a, in a Gata De Vita, Iron Butterfly, you know, that 10-minute that songs, I knew that everything that's really successful is like a two- to three-minute song, and it had a big hook. I learned that early on, so I kind of studied that, worked on that, and got pretty good at it. I think that helped me a lot when I finally joined Ted Nugent. It's amazing that you, just by watching other people, you learned that, okay, there's a three-minute song, there's a hook, not knowing at the time that that was the formula, right? and radio in most cases would never play it if it didn't have the three minutes in the hook. Exactly. So you were actually learning practical application just by learning and watching other people, not knowing that they were doing it that way for a reason. Right. Interesting. Did you ever have a plan B or was music your career path and that was it? Uh, no plan B. <laughs> uh, my parents had a lot of plan Bs for me, but um, and I have done a lot of different jobs. 
but I really never had a plan B. I don't know. You know, early on, I, I started because we kind of grew up in the in the city. My dad was always into um, horses, so for some reason, we started going out to this ranch and, and working with horses, even outside of Michigan. I mean, I mean, outside of Detroit, there, it, there's a lot of people always go, hey, you're from Detroit and you used to ride? Well, yeah, we still have a lot of farmland out there, a lot of corn. and So I kind of got interested in that at a young age, and I got good at it. Kind of not so much training, but I got hired to saddle like 12 horses every day and take 12 people out on a on a trail ride at a young age, like 13, 14 years old. So at some point, I guess I got pretty savvy with big animals, <laughs> knowing which ones will kick you, trying to saddle them up, which ones won't, which ones will bite you, and which ones won't, <laughs> which ended up being some pretty good experience for the future in rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> if rock and roll didn't work, you could join the circus. Right. <laughs> so no, I just always wanted to be Wanted to be in a band, and I wanted to live the life and see where it took us, you know, and just find out all about it. All right, so now let's fast forward mm -hmm. into the most notable part of your career, which is your history with Ted Nugent. Mm -hmm. So you're coming up in Michigan. Ted's in Michigan. How did the whole process go where you basically started working with Ted and became an active member of the band? Well, I... I had my own little local band. It was a three-piece band, and we got really lucky because we worked hard, and we, we had a lot of a lot of good songs, which we wrote ourselves, and the other guys would help me arrange things, but I pretty much wrote the songs. We would open up for different bands around town. That's how good we were. Uh, I think we were, at the age of 17, we opened up for Black Sabbath, we opened up for Aerosmith. We opened up for a bunch of different things like that. Well, in doing that, a tour ex-tour manager of Ted Nugent's came around, and he saw us playing. And he, he'd he been all around the world with um, a band called the Amboy Dukes with Ted Nugent. And he, you know, he said, wow, these, these three kids have something. And this one particular guy that plays guitar and sings has something. So he started to kind of guide us a little bit and help us, got us into different theaters to play in different places that we normally wouldn't have known how to do. There's a lot of hats in music. You know, there are managerial hats, there are writing hats, there are performing hats, singing, playing, you know. Well, at the time, we were just good musicians, so this guy was kind of like a business manager. So first thing he did was take me to Ted Nugent. And he goes, Ted, you're, you've got this band you, you've got going. It's, you, you finally got rid of your last lead singer. And I think Ted had gone through, gosh, maybe four lead singers, which it's got to be a red flag there somewhere. <laughs> Not what's, sure. What's the what common that, denominator? Yeah. <laughs> so he kept taking me up to his farm, and we would just hang out. And finally he said, well, you know, why, why don't you guys open up for us sometime? So we did. We started opening up shows for him. So every time we would open up a show, we played as hard and fast and good as we could. I'd look over and I'd see him on the side of the stage watching. We basically, you know, we, we kind of, we did the same thing, but he didn't sing. He just played guitar. So he's, uh, I, I even think he thought he was going to try to be a three-piece and start singing a little bit, but... He didn't do it. So it took a little bit for him to finally, I think it was about three months, he finally, he kept saying no. Because <laughs> this manager gentleman, whose name was Phil Nicholson, he kept bringing us back to Ted going, Ted, you need to hire these guys or you need to hire this this kid. Or I think there were intentions that Ted was going to hire my whole band, and get rid of his band, and that would have been it. But turned out, I was glad he didn't because his drummer and bass player fit what he was doing better. So he just asked me if I wanted to come up and jam with him. And I tell the same old story, and I'll tell it as quick as I can. I had kind of come to the end of my rope in Michigan and in Detroit playing in bands. And I think I'd gone as far as I could go. So, and then every time we kind of, you know, got together with, with Ted and it didn't work out, I just thought, well, okay, well, that's, he's like a major player and it, if that isn't working, I got to go someplace else. So I was married at the time and we decided to move to Los Angeles and I was 20. So we 
packed up a 24-foot truck, U-Haul, put a car on a dolly, packed everything up, and her mother lived in Los Angeles, and she was married to a contractor, so he had his own construction company. Well, I was going to move out there and start doing construction and maybe try to play on the side, and who knows what could happen in California or Hollywood. So, you know, it was a big what if, and it sounded like a lot of fun. So we go ahead and do all that, and we're actually sitting in the driveway of, of our apartment complex with the car on a tow dolly on the back of this 24-foot U-Haul. Uh, she's sitting in the truck, and I go, I'm going to go back in and unplug the phone, because back then it was the Bell telephone system, and you had to get the phone back. So I go in to, to unplug the phone, and it starts ringing. And this is no joke. Phone's ringing as I'm walking towards it. I pick it up, and it's Ted Nugent's agent. And he goes, hey, man, what are you doing? I go, oh, oh, just packing up, getting ready to leave to Los Angeles tomorrow. He goes, whoa, 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 no, wait a minute, whoa. I went, what? He goes, Ted wants to know if you'll come up and rehearse with the band today. And I'm thinking, holy moly, I just spent the whole day, you know, loading up everything out of an apartment. And so I said, well, hold on a second. So I just let that phone hang, and it's just on one of those curly cords that nobody ever sees anymore. And it's bouncing up and down on the ground. I go outside, and I, and I say to her, I say, this is Ted Nugent's agent. He wants me to come up and jam like today. She goes, okay, that's cool. Just um, take the car off the dolly and run up there and see what happens. And I went, you sure? And she goes, yeah. I go, okay. So I go back in, I go, all right, when's he? Well, he goes, well, about two hours. And I went, okay, it'll take me about an hour and 40 to get there. Okay, well, then here's the address. We'll see you up there. I hang the phone up, unplug it, bring it with, check out where no more, you know, the apartment complex is gone. And we're getting ready to leave the next morning. I take the car off the dolly. I drive up there. I go down into this farmhouse on 100 acres, which was the bass player's. We go downstairs, this dark, dank, pseudo-recording studio in somebody's basement, and we sit there and start jamming. We jammed for 20 minutes, throwing ideas back and forth, just like you and I are sitting down here. The drummer was here, just quietly you know, playing along, and 20 minutes went by, and Ted stopped everything, and he went, well, how many marshals do you want? And at the time, you know, a lot of people know now what they are, but marshals are English amplifiers. He asked me, how many amplifiers do I want? <laughs> I'm, th I'm thinking, I think he's asking me to join the band. <laughs> so I sat there for a minute and I went, I said, I'll take two stacks. <laughs> and back then, you know, it was two cabinets and a head. And uh, I wanted twice that. And he goes, okay. And that was it. That's how I joined the band. And from there, the next couple of days, the bass player said, so you have all your stuff in a truck? I go, yeah, we're leaving tomorrow. And he went, I'll tell you what, I could use some help out here. Would you want to move into this farmhouse, you and your wife, and, and we'll just split the rent and it'll be easy and, you know, we're gone a lot. And I went, okay. So we moved up there, moved everything in. But three days later, I'm leaving to go out on the road with these guys, and that's how quickly it happened. That's amazing. Only in rock and roll. Only in rock and roll. So in my research, mm -hmm. I discovered that you have not received any writer's credits, and more importantly, songwriting royalties for some of your songs with Ted Nugent. Is that true? And have you ever had? Have you ever tried to correct the situation? Um, it it is. It's true, and back then I can I can only chalk this up to being young and naive, and not knowing the business as well as the people around Ted back then, because there were many many times where we'd be in a room and we would be putting these songs together and writing parts, and I didn't even know what writing was. I I didn't know what you called it. Right. But here and there, I would go, hey, why don't we put this here, and why don't we do this two times here, and why don't we do that? And so did Ted, and so did every, everyone else. But then at the end of the day, because we didn't ask about it, and I just took it for granted that I was going to get a piece, 
Well, finally, when we found out that he had gone ahead, and I'll, I'll give him a little bit of a out on this because I don't know for sure. It could have been his producer, could have been his manager. But their suggestion was he put his name on everything. And a couple times, even on the song that I brought in that I, that I know that I wrote a couple years ago and brought to him, I said, no, 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 I don't, you know, you, I'm not doing that. And they go, well, you got to split the publishing and you, we'll let you have the writing, but you got to split the publishing. And, and back then, I didn't even know what publishing was. I didn't know what you got paid for a royalty for writing. I didn't know what you got paid for a royalty on publishing. I didn't know anything about that stuff. There were no schools to learn that back then. It was um, School of Hard Knocks. So it kind of went down. The first album came out, and a lot of the, the parts that I had helped with were on the album, and especially a lot of the vocals, most of, almost, say, 85% of any kind of melody I wrote. I was given a parameter and kind of an idea by somebody, but they, and that somebody was Ted, and could Ted sing the notes? No, if he could, he'd have done it. So I didn't know that you should have gotten writers for coming up with the melody of any part of the melody. Didn't know that either. On some of the stuff I made sure that I fought for by the time we started on the halfway through that album and then on the second album. And then um, the smarter we got as, as individuals, the tougher it got between us and, and maybe him and his management. Do we talk about it now? Yeah, we've talked about it a little bit, you know, we or many times we go back and forth going, I don't know what we were thinking back then. We should have done things differently. But we're also older now. Sure. So But yeah, there's quite a few things that are like Stranglehold I didn't get any writers for, and I should have because I came up with all all, all the melody for the vocal. Came up with a couple of the so song musical ideas. So at that point, should you be cutting on it? Yes. The thing that I love and have learned about Nashville, that Nashville started that. They, I mean, they know if two people are sitting in the room and you guys start to write a song, it's 50-50. Right. That's the deal. That's what you do. Is there enough money to go around for everybody? Yes. I mean, do you want 100% of nothing or do you want 50% of a pretty cool little idea that finally gets recognized. Not knowing any of that stuff, uh, you know, it was a little tougher in Detroit, and nobody was going to, you know, teach you. Like, it's, it's, it's common knowledge here. And it took a long time for me to, to, to go, wow, these kids today, they're learning this stuff, and they know this stuff now. But back then, a young kid like myself, I didn't even know how to spell lawyer, let alone have one. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't care. All I wanted to do was be a rock and roll musician. I don't even think the word star is part of it. I just wanted to be a rock and roll guy. So we didn't have that kind of um, guidance. But then as you start to watch, and when you do a lot of things and record a lot of things in New York, I started watching and talking and listening and people telling me things. And that's when we got smarter it only caused more trouble when we got smarter. That's why on the second album, the Free For All album, there are some troubles. Now, anybody can sit here and tell their story of what happened. But there were quite a few knocking around of song ideas and production ideas with the producer at the time. And with I don't think we had trouble with Ted. It was mainly the producer. But we finally got to one spot where I just thought it was all going down the tube on a couple songs. And I, and I spoke up and he didn't like it. And he said, if you don't like it, you should just quit. Now, this is a guy talking to me, not even Ted. And Ted's not even in the room. I finally thought, okay, well, you know what? I don't see anybody around here kind of sticking up for me but me. And I, I just thought, you know what? I said, fine. I said, I'm out. So I split. I went home. They started putting another person's vocal over mine, which happened to be this guy by the name of Meatloaf, who went on to be quite famous and a great singer, great, great guy, great player. 
Um, so he came in and he sang all the songs and he did a good job. Did it sound like me? No. Do I sound like him? No. Right. He finishes a lot of the songs and he goes, they take it to the Monday morning record company meetings. And this is just on the free for all album, just a little history. People always go, how come you didn't sing on da 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 da? I said, well, I did sing them all. But then when I was asked, asked to leave and I said, you know, I've had enough, then they brought another guy and just pulled my voice off and put his on. So when they took the, the new album to Epic and sat around the big table and listened to it on the Monday morning, as they did all the artists, you know, they listened to everything that they were doing, a couple of people in the meeting said, Wait a, wait a minute, who's that guy singing? And they went, oh, that's this new guy. And they, they said, new guy? Wait a minute, we just had, this last album just went gold. Why are we changing that up? And they didn't have a good answer. And so they said, no, 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 we, we want the other guy. Sure enough, I'm sitting at home. <laughs> and they called me up and said, hey, okay, we'd like you to come back, but under these circumstances, and this has got to be this and that. And I said, well... I said, I'm cool with that. I'm not cool with that. I'm cool with this. I'm not cool with that. But if we can agree on all this, that'll be fine. So, yeah, I came back. They'd already finished that free-for-all album, so it was going out. They pushed it out. But I was back for the Cash Crush Fever album, which was the third one. So it's just crazy how a lot of it is It's trying to be an artist. Everybody wants to be an artist, but it's hard to be an artist and also share your idea of your artistry. And it's hard to let go sometimes. You do have to learn how to do it. It took me a little longer to figure that out. Not being clear on what the division of the partnership is and what you're getting for it. Sometimes I wouldn't bring my best stuff. I'd hold it back. Or I wouldn't give my best idea. And that just hurt us, you know. So then by Catch Scratch Fever, I just made sure I cut a better deal, and then I, we started to throw a lot of ideas around. But, you know, sometimes you can be around people, and you can play something for them, and all of a sudden, they'll go away. There's no way to, to save it unless you record it right then and there. All of a sudden, they've come up with this new idea that they call it theirs. <laughs> Sounds a lot like your idea. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. It happens more than, than you'd want to imagine, you know. So you have to be careful. You want to be a writer and you want to play music, but you got to be careful because it can be easily knocked off. One of my old bosses once told me that we're in the music business. And the music business was about 20% music yep. and about 80% business. <laughs> yep. And he told me, and I was, this was in my 20s. And when he told me that, you're just like, okay, whatever. Yeah. And then fast forward, the years that I've been in this business, you start to see and hear stories and learn things. And you're like, you know what? That old guy was right. He was right. Yeah. Music yeah. is only a small part of it. The business is based on music, but it's only a small part of it. Yeah. It's and that can be a good or a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, the kids have such, such a great advantage now. I mean, they never had a Belmont Back when I was growing up, there was nobody. There, you didn't have curb. Right. You didn't have somebody that cared. You know that that built an institution that you that kids can learn this kind of stuff. And who knew? Truly, who knew it was going to be a business? I mean, it was a little bit of a business in the '30s, '40s, and '50s. But then all of a sudden, you know, like '60s, in the '70s, it started to become big business. Big business. And that's when the business. That's when the lawyers and the managers all kind of swooped in like vultures. They're going, holy moly, now we can make, all we got to do is get, let's take these kids and take their songs, we'll make a bunch of money. And that's kind of, kind of what it might even still be a little bit today. But. Sure. And I've never met Ted, but even in Ted's defense and hearing this, yep. we don't know who was talking into his ear. Right that got a percentage of his revenue, not your revenue, exactly. and said, hey, Ted, if you structure it this way, this will be better for you. Right. When their intention was not necessarily taking care of Ted, but taking care of themselves. Right. And most of you it know, was And like, unfortunately, right. that happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
And I, I, I believe a lot of that was true. He had been ripped off before himself, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, by a lot of New York business people, which are some of the toughest, and he learned his lesson. So it's not called the uh, music and friends. It's called the music <laughs> business. <laughs> there you go. So um, back to Ted. Are you and Ted currently on good terms? Do you all talk a lot? Or you know, what's your current relationship we're with on, Ted? We're on good terms. He's kind of like my older brother. Way older. No. <laughs> No, he's kind of like my older brother. I mean, you know, if if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. You know, if it wasn't for me, he probably wouldn't be sitting where he's sitting. So are we buddies? Yes. We've been buddies a long time. Do we know each other really well? Yes. Do we get along better now? Absolutely. Do we respect each other more now? Absolutely. I had a chance to break away from the Ted Nugent band and, and be my own band leader, and I quickly learned a lot of hard things I had to do and choices I had to make, which he had to, had to do himself. And so I even called him once, and I said, man, I got to apologize to you, man. I, being the band leader is not easy. We talk about that stuff. And I think I went back, it was 2011 maybe or 2012, we kind of rekindled our playing together relationship and we went back out and did some shows. And one night we got done with a week stretch and, and he said, there's nobody at my my place and we're close and we're flying back. Why don't you just, just hang at the hotel? Why don't you just fly back with me and we'll hang out at, at my place, which we used to do a lot in the early days. You know, we used to hang out all the time, he and I. And I always shared a room with him. So I learned all kinds of stuff <laughs> on the road that you probably should do and shouldn't do. <laughs> but So we went back to his place, full-grown men, sitting there on the couch, probably 2.30 in the morning, looking at each other and going, what were we thinking back then? Why did we waste all that valuable time? And why didn't we just do what we do now? Because we get along. We share things back and forth. But I think when you get older, it's easier for you not to want to be in charge of everything. The older you get, you just go, man, let this guy do his job. Let this guy do his job. Let me do this job. And we just sat there and went, man, we, can, we just can't figure out why we're not friendly and getting in fights and scrabbles all the time. We used to, and we used to buck him all the time. And he only knew what he knew. He only knew one way to try to keep five or six people going straight down the road with all of us trying to buck it and fight it. He did, a, he did a great job just trying to keep it all together. And we learned a lot of stuff. But are we on good terms? Absolutely. So you were featured in the documentary Hired Gun. Yes. How well did that documentary depict you know, what it's really like to be a musician or even a singer? For hire. I think that was a really good documentary. You know, there's another one, what is it called, 20 feet from the stage or 30 feet from the stage, which is also a good one. But I think this one was a good one because it had a chance to go into the rock world. People playing in bands, egos. Ego is the biggest thing about a band. And you have to have an ego to stand in front of 60,000 people and act out and act a fool <laughs> or perform in front of somebody. So it takes a lot of ego. You get three or four egos in the same room that are big. I mean, it's pretty freaking dynamic. I think that documentary is a pretty good one. There's a lot of stuff that was left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> and thank goodness. But I thought my part was, mine was all true to form. I thought, you know, I told my story like I thought it was. And I know I have a good friend that was in that movie, Liberty DeVito, the drummer from Billy Joel, and I think he told his story pretty well. But it's just, a, it's a shame, you know what I mean? Again, music business is 20% the music and the rest is business. When you get in a band, if you think, there's no way anybody can get, get rid of me because what I do and what I did and what I recorded cannot be replaced. Well, yes, it can. And anybody that thinks it can't, you already see Adam Lambert subbing in for one of the greatest rock singers ever. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of growing up and learning 
being in a rock and roll band or any kind of band. I think that documentary depicted pretty well what can happen. I, th- I think it's a must see for anybody who wants to be in a band. Yeah, I think so. Whether you're a musician or even a, even the lead singer or an artist, it's yeah. it's, it's it can education. Hurt. It can't hurt to see that one. Yeah, absolutely. Over the years, and you've kind of touched on this already, now that you're older and wiser, Mm -hmm. have you gotten more involved with the business side of your career? I mean, obviously, you're aware now of the pitfalls if you're not hands-on or involved or at least know what's going on. I mean, do you pay a lot more attention now to that side of the business? Yes. I would say for me now, I know how to wear three or four different hats. And I, and I have no problem with doing it. A lot of people don't know how to sell themselves. A lot of people don't know how to stick up for themselves. I've gotten really good at it. You, know, you just have to figure out what it is that you want and what you're looking for and stick to the plan. If somebody wants you, you know, if you're reasonable and you're, you learn how to be a pretty good negotiator, you pretty much can get what you want. I mean, I'm my own negotiator. I didn't used to be. Could I have done it back then? Yes, but I had other people around me that did it. It's a lot more fun for me now to be the negotiator and get the 80% of the business behind me and then go out and do the best 20% of the music I possibly can, which is very enjoyable at this age, which is 68, and I've been doing this a long time. Do I feel like I'm 68? No. Um, Do I play like it? I don't think so, but I, I don't know. You'd have to be the judge. <laughs> so in, in the current business model of Derek St. Holmes, do you have a team around you? Do you have an agent? Are you self-managed? Do you have management? Or nope. what, what's your process? I, right now I manage myself, and I get a lot of help from my wife, my partner. She is good in that department anyway, as she always was. So I get, we, we kind of do that ourselves for the part of the business that I'm in now. I don't really need a manager anymore. I think when you're young and starting out, you should definitely get some help or take some classes on management and know what you're getting yourself into. So. In the current business model of what you're doing as an artist, is is most of your revenue or what you're doing just touring, or do you have plans on? I mean, you've mentioned two yeah. other records you want to do, but yeah. is I, recording a big part of your career or future? Or is it just live events? You know, for me, where do you see your balance? For me, it's live. I, I I mean, I make most of my money live, and thank goodness because I love that part. Writing songs to me is always come easy. So that's not a drudgery for me. And I also work better under pressure. I could probably write a whole album in one day if I had to, just being under pressure. But if I just sit around and you know go through the normal day of life, I'm kind of lazy. I can, I can go, I'll do that tomorrow. Or I got this one part and I'll put that together with that. Third. But I mean, I do my best work when I'm, when I'm under pressure. But that's recording. Do I make a lot of money off recording? No, you don't. I don't. I mean, I'm sure young guys now with all the streaming and they know how to do that. I don't I don't know how to do all that streaming. Plus, I don't really I don't want to work that much like the young guys do now. I mean, I don't have the gumption for it. (laughs) I understand. Um, Do I do well? Yes. Do I take a lot of I do a lot of weekend fly dates and I enjoy that. If I I mean, if I do four fly dates a month. That's great for me. If I did six or eight, I'd start to think, "Mm, I don't want to work that hard. I don't want to do that many. (laughs) And some guys are just dying to be glad they had it. I spent a lot of time touring around the world. I had a lot of fun doing it. Been to many places, many times. Have a lot of friends all over the world. I don't feel like I want to do that now. Uh, not even if I had a big hit single, I still would not want to do that now. You know, it's funny. You hear guys like Eric Clapton, you know, uh, God bless him. If it wasn't for him, kids wouldn't even know what the blues are, you know. True. And he's slowing He's slowing down. I'm watching him slow down. He's probably 10 years older than me. He just doesn't want to do it. He goes out and he does, you know, just a few concerts and a tour spreads it out now. I was just, I was offered to go out and open up for ZZ Top this year to do a couple shows. But in today's market, 
they don't pay anybody to do that anymore. Right now, you'll find 10 bands that'll pay you to let them play on your show. Now, that's all fine and well for guys that had never done it before, but I don't care about it that much anymore. So I told them that I would, for the kind of money that they were talking, I would have to bow out. I was so proud and thankful that they asked me. But maybe in another time when it works out better, it's a better string of dates together. So we're still kind of working on that, but but we'll see. I mean, would it be fun to open up for ZZ Top? Absolutely. We did a lot of playing together back in the 70s. It was ZZ Top, Ted Nugent, Ted Nugent, ZZ Top. And great people, great players. Right now I have a three-piece band, and I love three-piece because you can hear everything. And to go out and open up for a th- one of the greatest three-piece bands in, in the business would be an absolute hoot. You know, it'd be fun. So we'll see. But is uh, am I proud that somebody asked me that? Yeah. And that's through relationships that I got that offer. So it could be fun. But we'll see. And for some of you who are listening who may not be completely familiar with Derek's work or even how big of an artist Ted was, Ted Nugent, Back in the 70s, mm-hmm. something you even alluded to in the beginning of this interview, Journey used to open up for you. Yeah. yeah. And you've also toured with Van Halen. You just said ZZ Van Top. Halen used to open up for Van us. Halen yeah. used to open they up were kids. for Ted Nugent. Yeah. So the history and magnitude of Ted Nugent and how big his career was and what you were involved with during that era of the music business is probably unparalleled by a lot of artists because a lot of artists in the current state of the business may not ever even get as big as what Ted was right. or Journey was right. or ZZ Top. So you so, have a, a reference and a history that's quite phenomenal. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and you know, it's, it's a lot. It was a lot of work. And thank goodness we were young when we did it all. It was a lot of playing. We hardly were ever home. And there was a lot of touring. We brought up a lot of bands. There was a band called Boston. We took them out on their very first tour. There was a band called Foreigner. We took them out on their very first tour. And the reason we did is because there were probably five American bands back in that 70s era that were the biggest bands in America. And we were one of those five. Um, so it, it's, it's wild looking back at it all now. Sometimes, you know, people go, well, do, do you miss it? And I go, well, I don't, I don't really miss it because I did it. When some people ask me, well, what were some of the greatest parts about it? Well, have you got any idea what it feels like to stand on stage and hear 300,000 people clapping and cheering for you? <laughs> that's like, that's the best drug in the world. <laughs> I mean, it is phenomenal. I mean, does anybody know what it's like to sit in a... 80,000 seat stadium and had people just cheer you on after your song and uh, I mean it's like that's a high that you know you just never forget Leonard Skidder we all started off at the same time those guys just and God bless them they're still carrying it on too I think it's wonderful they've think, also been here at Ocean Way <laughs> is that right yeah 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 <laughs> had to throw in a shameless plug Absolutely. um yeah. So at this part of your life and career, do you see yourself diversifying into other things outside of music? Or do you have other interests? I do not. I think what I'm going to do is stick with the live portion of it and actually performing. I'm going to stick with writing songs and playing them live. I don't really care about the size of the audience. I just want to play. And when I was 15 years old, I just wanted to play. I just wanted to sing. I just like the way it feels. And I wanted to, everybody says it, I guess, but I just wanted to make people happy. I wanted to make it be a party, make people move and make them. I love to make people move. I think one of the things about a good song, if you can come up with a song and you can play it for somebody, you can watch their reaction. If you make them move, you're probably in the right direction. I went in with a country artist last week, and I've never done that before, and that was just absolutely awesome. And the gentleman's name was Jim Brown, and he's just a just a sweet, sweet man. He's, and he's got his own career of, of which I didn't know about, and I, I Googled, and I went on YouTube and searched it all out, and, I, and he's spent a lot of time. 
But he came up to me and asked me if I would come in and play guitar on his song. And I said, absolutely. So we did that last week. We did that at Peter Frampton's studio, which, which was nice. I would have much rather have done it over here at Ocean Way, but you never know. Um, I had a shameless plug. I'd like to do my, my next album here at Ocean Way, but we'll see how it all works out. But um, country, is, it's morphed into something different. And it would be fun to take some of my rock knowledge because it seems to be country start is being a little bit more grassroots rock, too. I yes. mean, it's almost like rock country. I'm hearing a lot of people emulate what we did already. So would it be fun to go and be in some of these sessions and maybe help some of these players out and some of these musicians? Absolutely. I think that would be going forward. In my career, I think that'd be a lot of fun. So who knows? We'll, we'll see where it carries us. I have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, just real quick. Um, what advice have you been given that stuck with you the most throughout your career? I think for me it was keep your nose clean, be good at what you do, make as many friends as you can, try not to hurt anybody. And is there advice that you would want to pass on to the future generation, the up-and-coming artist? I would say be true to your craft, be true to yourself. Don't let anybody get too deep into your way of, of how you want to write your songs and deliver them. Um, because that's the beauty of music is when it is true and comes out of somebody and don't let everybody get their hands on it and, and turn it around. I mean, so just kind of be true to yourself and true to your your material that you write and, and your ideas and stick to your guns, you know. Those are the guys that go forward. Everybody else that kind of starts, you know, if you waffle and go, well, I didn't, I don't know if this is going to sound okay. Just know your stuff is good and, and stick to it. That's that's the hardest thing, man. Just stick with it because not everybody's going to make it. There are a lot of kids out there and a lot of people out there that are, you know, even I, I get mesmerized by it here. Are there enough jobs for all these people to get when they graduate and where are they going? And, you know, how big is the business going to get? And, but a good song is a good song. So if you write a good song, and you're true to yourself, you may make it. It all starts with a song. Right. Okay. Done with the questions. Now we're going to do one last little segment, which will be in all of our podcasts. This is the It's Going to Be Great podcast. Right. Which is our slogan. Right. Or theme here at Ocean Way. Right. So I've got just a couple of really quick points based on the theme of It's Going to Be Great. What was the, and this is a question that I like to ask pretty much any artist or musician that I come in contact with because it's fascinating for me personally. Um, what is the greatest concert you've ever been to and why? Greatest concert I've ever been to, I would have to say <sighs> Jimi Hendrix Experience, probably 1967. Um, and the reason why is because we heard about him. Um, we didn't know what it was going to be like. We were lucky enough to get tickets nine rows back. And a friend of ours, mother, bought the tickets for us, <laughs> drove us down there, and we sat there and watched this guy perform. And it was absolutely every bit as good as the record that we held in our hands and listened to for weeks before we went to see him. And it was kind of life-changing for me to s hear the music and then go see this man play live, and these three guys be so good. That was life-changing for me. I can't even imagine. Mm. If you go to my office upstairs, it's a shrine to Jimi Hendrix. So <laughs> I feel you. Um, what was, in your opinion, what is one of, or what is the greatest record of all time, and why? Ooh, that's a tough one. Greatest record of all time. Well. That is a tough one. I, I would I would not be able to answer that one. There would be too many. Um, but I think 
of course, there are things from going back to, for me, even back to the old blues stuff, going back to guys like Eddie Cochran, going back to going back to the ventures, going going back to the animals and going back to seeing the Stones and then the Beatles. I mean, one album. I think I think you got me. I I, I got nothing. I got nothing. Since you're a rock guy, pick the greatest rock record. Um, Narrow it down a little bit, if you can. <laughs> what was the uh, what was that Rolling Stones album that they did in six by nine or something or five by seven or something? It was one of those. I think is when I started to hear a lot of a lot of kind of what I wanted to do when I got in the studio. The way people sang, the way guitars sounded, the way parts were played, the way songs were put together. Probably a, I don't know, or probably a Rolling Stone six by nine. I think it was six by nine. Not, I don't know. I have it on my phone. Yeah, that was a point where I went. I'm not a Beatles dude. I'm a hard rock Stones dude, and so I kind of leaned that way for the rest of my life. Right. Yeah. So I still didn't give it to you, but that's all right. You'll figure it out. In your opinion, who's the greatest artist? That would be of me. All time. <laughs> no. no. Cut. We're done. <laughs> Thanks for having me. No. <laughs> Perfect answer. I, Perfect answer. Let's just see. Who do I think is the greatest? Oh gosh. Again. Oh man, I don't know. Um, can you fine hone that question? <laughs> greatest rock artist. Let's, greatest, narrow, let's greatest, narrow it to your genre. Greatest rock artist. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go out on a limb on this one. Um, even for today, if you were to see the person in his prime, and any of these people, I would probably pick Elvis if it was me. I think a lot of people would would agree with you yeah. on that. Yeah, but I mean. You know, Steven Tyler's great. <laughs> Alice Cooper's great. You know, a lot of great stuff. Last question. Who is the greatest artist that you would like to work with or would have liked to have worked with and why? Ah. Uh, I think... I think there was a time... When I would have liked to have worked with Bob Seger. Uh, and why? Because Bob wrote really good songs. But he still kept the hard rock thing about himself and kept it in the music, but still made it palatable. And we don't want to call it pop, but he, he still made good singles. I mean, he was good at it, and I met him once. Only one time did I meet him, and he was very nice, and I thought, wow, a guy that good, that'd be fun to work with him and see what you could come up with. So I'd, I'd probably say Bob Seger. Another Ocean Way alum, Bob Seger. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I did not know that. Well, Derek, thank you for being on the podcast. Man, thank you this so is, much for having me. The, that was a it's blast. It's going to be a great podcast. It was great having you record here at Ocean Way. Hopefully, we'll Thank get to you have you that. back very soon. I hope so. Thank um, you. Yes. Appreciate you taking your time today. Appreciate Absolutely. your insight. Absolutely. And hopefully, uh, the listeners at home will be able to learn a little bit more about you and your history and even learn a little bit about the music business. Um, Thank you. We will post all of your social media stuff. Awesome. Uh, in the comments. So, uh, anything else you'd like to say in passing or in closing? No, just um, God bless rock and roll. <laughs> go there get you it. Go. That's there it. it is. Hey, 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 everybody. Are you looking for some cool studio swag? Why, yes, I am. Well, if you are, then we got you covered. You can get your own Oceanway Nashville studio merchandise at our web store www.oceanwaynashville.com forward slash store. Once again, that's www.oceanwaynashville.com forward slash store. It's going to be great. It's going to be great.